Right now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 16, we read this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This has been our starting point for this entire series of studies, looking at the inspiration of Scripture, uh, how Scripture originated, originated with God, not with men, at, at its profit for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, and its purpose, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Obviously, if the purpose of Scripture is to perfect the saints, then we have to have a perfect book. You couldn't get perfected saints from an imperfect book. So it's important that we understand where God's Word is, we identify it that we, so that we can study it and become perfected saints. Now, last week, this week, and then again next week, we've been looking at a comparison of verses between the King James Bible and the New International Version. And that comparison comes from the fact that when we start with the original autographs, original manuscripts of Scripture, we diverge into two different lines of text at that point. One is the received text, uh, also called sometimes the majority text. It's the text from which the King James Bible uh, comes. It's the text that was used to translate the King James Bible. There is also a text which is referred to as the minority text. It is the text from which all new Bibles come. Uh, the first in that line was the Revised Standard Version in 1881. Uh, the NIV is another in that line, which is what we're looking at today uh, in this series, the New International Version. We've seen in our studies that 95% of all the texts and all the witnesses are in agreement with the readings of the received text. 5% are in agreement with the readings of the minority text. What we're doing now, and, and we've, you know, if you uh, get the CDs or DVDs, you can go back and look at some of the information that we covered to get to this point. Also, much of this information is, is historical in nature when you get to the production of the King James Bible and the Revised Standard Version. Um, that's readily available if you want to study and understand more about this. Um, we're looking now, beginning last week and then this week and next week, at a comparison between these two different sets. Because of all the hundreds of Bible versions that are available today, there really are only two. There is the received text, which is where your King James Bible comes from, and there is the minority text, which is where all the other new Bibles come from. The NIV, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, um, the Living Bible, today's English Bible, all of those Bibles come from this set of texts. So what we're comparing is not really hundreds of different versions, but really only two sets of text, the received text and the minority text. The text uh, received by the early church and, and, and supported by 95% of the witnesses and the minority text rejected by the early church and received by just 5% or, or, or uh, uh, testified to by only 5% of the witnesses. Now we started looking at verses last week <clears throat> and we're going to do that again today. So we'll just get right into looking at some of those verses um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. I'm sorry, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. Now first we'll read as we have been in the King James Bible and then we'll look at it in the NIV. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Pretty clear statement, you're bought with a price, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, you are bought at a price, therefore honor God in your body. Now obviously what's missing is pretty clear, in your spirit, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The NIV says only honor God in your body. That reference to your spirit being God's is a reference to your security. You are secure in Christ. You have spiritual life in Him. And that reference omitted here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and again, the omission 
based not on the fact that, well, these, these people just didn't want to put it in, but based on the fact that the manuscript from which they're translating doesn't contain that reference, doesn't contain those words. So they can't translate the words and put them there if they don't exist. You see, one of the, the reasons given, in fact, the primary reason given always for a new translation is, well, we want to update the language. We want to make it more current, more relevant. Well, but in seeking to do that, the new Bibles, so-called, have rejected the underlying text, the received text, and instead replaced it with the minority text, so that it's not simply just an updated translation, but it is a completely different text from which the translation comes. Also, as we saw last week, the whole, the whole idea that, well, we must update the translation, we must make it more current, we must make it more relevant, we must make it more like the common man in the street, any subject that we study requires us to learn specific grammar, specific terms. If you're studying math, if you're studying biology, if you're studying chemistry, whatever it is, you have to learn the grammar and the terminology of that subject. When you're studying the Bible, you have to learn the grammar and terminology of that subject. Every word can't be put into words that you commonly use in the street from day to day. It can't read like your newspaper. You don't expect to pick up a biology textbook and have it read like your morning paper. You don't expect to pick up a chemistry textbook and have it read like your morning paper. You shouldn't expect to pick up a spiritual textbook, your Bible, and have it read like the morning paper. There are specific words that are used for specific reasons. Words like propitiation, justification, <laughs> sanctification, all these are words that perhaps are not used in your common everyday life, but they have specific meaning and should be there in this spiritual textbook called the Bible. So updating translation, number one, is, is not a necessary tool all the time. It is occasionally the, the 1611 King James Bible is the result of updating the translations available, but that translation, the 1611 King James Bible, is still very readable and understandable in today's language. The language has not changed and evolved to the point where it's not understandable. Secondly, that was used as an excuse to get rid of the received text and instead use the minority text from which to translate. Let's look at some other examples. Ephesians chapter 3. This is one we talked about last week how many of these uh, omissions and changes between the two sets of text uh, have to do with the deity of Christ and with supporting that deity and building up that deity of Christ. This, this one is such a case. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 uh, in the King James Bible says this, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. There's a clear statement to Jesus Christ being the means and the method of creation. Uh, God created all things by Jesus Christ. It is the, God is the master architect, Jesus Christ the master builder that went out and executed the Father's plan. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 in the NIV reads this way, And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept, kept hidden in God, who created all things. Now what's the difference? Well, obviously, the, the King James Version, the end of that verse says, Hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The end of that verse in the NIV says, God or hidden in God who created all things. So you notice the phrase, by Jesus Christ, is not there in the NIV, and it is there in the King James. Why? Because the manuscript, the Greek text types that your King James translators used, contain that phrase, by Jesus Christ. The manuscripts that the NIV translators used did not contain that phrase, by Jesus Christ. So it's not a matter of, well, they just didn't translate it the same way. It's a matter of the words aren't there. So again, how many words do you have to take away before it's not God's word? Just one. And these words are important. It's, a, it's a, a, another support and another confirmation of the deity of Jesus Christ. God created all things, how? 
by Jesus Christ. It points to Christ and confirms him as being the creator along with the Father. Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 we read this. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Of course this is speaking of Christ and his work at Calvary. In whom we have redemption. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14 reads this way in the NIV. In whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So what's missing? Well, through his blood, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So what's missing in the NIV? His blood, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Why isn't that phrase there? Because in the text from which the, King, or from which the New International Version translators translated, that doesn't exist. Now it's interesting, you'll see a note, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse number uh, 14, there's a note at the bottom of the page, at least in this NIV that I have, that says, a few late manuscripts, redemption through his blood. That is, they say a few late manuscripts have that phrase, redemption through his blood. Well, that's misleading. Some of the manuscripts that have that phrase are later manuscripts. But to say a few would seem to indicate, well, there are very few that say that. And that's not the case. The manuscript type that says that comprises 95% of the witnesses. The manuscript type that doesn't say that comprises 5% of the witnesses. So to say, well, there are a few that have that in is simply not true. Um, so again, that, that, that omission is pretty important. Redemption through his blood is an important principle that, that is a part of, of all that we teach here at Grace Alive and in many churches, that redemption is through Jesus Christ and through his shed blood. And so to omit that, now does that mean the NIV never anywhere talks about being redeemed by the blood of Christ? Nope, doesn't mean that at all. The NIV does talk about the blood of Christ and being redeemed by his blood. But the omission indicates that there's some problem, some underlying problem, not even just with the translators, but with the text from which it's translated. Because that's where the omission is. The omission is not in the translation, but in the Greek manuscripts from which the translation is being made. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Romans 1, verse 16. <clears throat> and we'll need to find it in, in both of our Bibles here. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. And in the King James Bible, we'll read this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Very strong statement that Paul makes about the gospel and who it is that's the center of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's that gospel that is the power of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 in the New International Version reads this way. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now again, just setting aside for a moment the, the obvious difference just in the translation, in the words that are used, and in the way two different translators would translate the same passage, just the same text, I am not ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ, the King James Bible says. I am not ashamed of the gospel, the NIV says. What's missing? Well, those two words, of Christ. Now, does that mean that the NIV never talks about Jesus Christ? Not at all. But in this verse, where it's pretty clear, Paul's making a strong statement about the gospel of, I'm not ashamed, and what you're ashamed of is Christ. If you're going to be ashamed, you're ashamed of him. And Paul tells us throughout his epistles not to be ashamed of Christ and of his name and of the fact that, that he died for our sins. Yet that, and, and why is it omitted? 
because the text that the NIV translators were translating from doesn't contain those words, of Christ. Again, it's an omission. And what is omitted? Well, once again, interestingly enough, Christ is omitted. And the centrality of Christ and his importance is omitted and is diminished. And does it matter? Can you still find verses about Christ in the NIV? Absolutely. But why would we omit a reference to Christ? Every reference to Christ especially is important. And every reference to him and his work bolsters his power and his authority and his place in our plan of redemption. So to omit one is to diminish that. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 31. Acts 16 and verse number 31. In the King James Bible we read this. And they said... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Acts chapter 16, verse number 31 in the NIV, And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. Well, again, the, the omission or the difference is obvious. The King James Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The NIV says, believe on the Lord Jesus. Is it still telling you to believe on the Lord Jesus? Yes. Why would the word Christ be omitted? Why? Om- well, because in the text from which the NIV translators are translating, the word Christ is simply not there. 5% of the, the available witnesses and manuscripts don't have that word. 95% do have that word. So what are we to do? Well, your King James Bible translators rightly included that. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's a strong statement by, by Paul and Silas. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. His full title, his full name. His earthly name is Jesus, but he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he is the Christ, the Redeemer, the Deliverer. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said in the day of Pentecost, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's his title, Lord. He's made that Jesus whom you crucified, his earthly name, both Lord and Christ. And that name, as Paul makes this pronouncement here um, in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 47. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 47, and we'll get that in both of our Bibles here, so that we can compare the two. And, and I hope, you know, the, these verses are going up on the screen so that you can see them and compare them. But I hope also that you have your own copies there so that, that you can see as we read that this is what the verses say. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. This is a reference to the first Adam and the last Adam, that The first Adam was of the earth, earthy. The last Adam, the second man here in this passage, uh, is the Lord from heaven. If you look in verse 45, so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So it's a reference to Adam and Christ. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Verse 47, the first one is of the earth, that's Adam, made from the dust of the ground. The second man is the Lord from heaven. His origin was not here on the earth. The Lord came from heaven to the earth and took upon him the form of a servant. 1 Corinthians 14, uh, I'm sorry, 15 verse 47 in the NIV reads this way. I want to find the verse here. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. The first man of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. Now what's missing? Well, the King James Bible says the second man is the Lord from heaven. So it's not just a second man, another man like Adam coming from heaven. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Why doesn't the NIV call him Lord? 
because the text from which they were translating didn't call him Lord. And I keep wanting to emphasize that when you're, when you're dealing with the new versions, you're not dealing with just a difference of translation. Well, I prefer this translation. I prefer this translation. This translation speaks to me. This is in more clear English. That's not the issue. The issue is that the text from which they're translating is different. The text of the King James Bible says one thing. The text from, uh, of the NIV says something different. The text of the King James Bible, the Greek text says, the second man is the Lord from heaven. The, the Greek text of the NIV says, the second man is from heaven. Matthew chapter 18. Let's get back into the Gospels here. Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 10. Matthew 18 and <clears throat> verse number 10. And let's find that now in the NIV. Matthew 18 and verse, we'll begin reading at verse 10 and we'll read down through verse 12. Matthew 18 beginning at verse 10 and we'll read down through verse 12. First in the King James Bible, Matthew 18, 10. Take heed uh, that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh the one which is gone astray? So that's a, a pretty clear-cut verse here, uh, especially verse 11 when you read, the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. It's the importance of who Jesus Christ was. He was the Son of Man. What did He come to this earth for? He came to save that which was lost. Let's read the same passage now, Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 10 in the NIV, and we read this. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you, that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go and look for the one that wandered off? You know, what is it that's missing? Maybe, you know, just for me reading that, you can't see what's missing. If it's there on your screen, you should be able to tell what's missing. In Matthew chapter 18, we have in the King James Bible, verse 10, which talks about them beholding the face of his Father in heaven. And that's what we have at the end of verse 10 uh, in, the, in the NIV. They always see the face of my Father in heaven. Verse 12 begins, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep? Verse 12 in the NIV, What do you think, if a man owns a hundred sheep? But you know what's missing? In your King James Bible, there's a verse 11 between 10 and 12. In this NIV Bible, there is no verse 11. It goes 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14. So they're not, it's not even numbered correctly. Why? Again, as we pointed out last week, because if you go to chapter 18 in your King James Bible and you say, oh, there's 35 verses. And you go to chapter 18 in your, in your NIV, oh, there's 35 verses. But are there really 35 verses in the NIV? There aren't, are there? There's really only 34, because verse 11, and what verse is missing? The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What a terrible verse to have in your Bible. <laughs> that the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Why would we say such a thing? Well, the point is not why would you say it, the point is why would you let it out? You would let it out because the minority text from which this Bible, the NIV, is translated, doesn't have that verse. It's as simple as that. It just doesn't exist there. The majority text from which the King James Bible is translated has that verse. That verse, verse 11, is there. And again, very deceitful to number the verses in your Bible and skip a number so that it looks like all the verses are there when really all the verses are not there. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 43. <clears throat> Mark 9 and verse number 43. Mark chapter 9, and let's find that now in the NIV. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 43. All right, Mark chapter 9, verse 43, uh, we read this. 
And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's your King James Bible. Pretty clear statement about hell, about punishment, about damnation. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 43, uh, we read this. Uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be thrown into hell. Well, what's missing? Well, have you noticed there's a verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, and verse 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. In the NIV, verse 44 and verse 46 don't exist. Now, verse 48 exists, which says, where their worm dies, does not die, and the fire is not quenched. But the first two times he says it, it's just not there. Why not? Well, because in the text from which this is taken, it's not there. It just doesn't exist. In the text from which your King James Bible is taken, it does exist. And once again, as the NIV does consistently, although the verses are gone, it skips the number where they should be. So it appears like when I get to verse 48, I'm, I'm right on the right verse. But you're not because it's numbered 43, 45, 47, 48. Can't even count the number of verses. We'll look at more of these differences and omissions next week. In fact, we'll demonstrate to you how the NIV and the New Bibles actually contradict themselves.